Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. How to choose a successor. I have read no book on this subject because I don't know, maybe they don't deal with it. But I had a problem trying to find the answer to this question. How to choose a successor. So I decided for the last 14 years to do my own research to try to decipher from the life of Jesus Christ, who is the greatest leader of all time, how to go about choosing a successor. I also wanted to know how do you process that? So I began to also study the successful transitions in history, beginning, of course, with biblical cases, case studies. And what I discovered changed and shocked me. And it's going to shock you also. Now, I can't tell you everything I learned about this because it's so much, but I want to get right to the meat of this. I think you are convinced by now, hopefully, that you must prepare to die. You must prepare to also move off the scene eventually to make room for the next phase of leadership or the next generation. The problem is, how do you go about doing that? Uh, how do you really identify your successor and the person you need to mentor or the persons you want to mentor um, out of among whom will emerge your successor. And I want to share with you what I discovered. I have also applied this to my own experience in leadership and it works. So let's talk about how to choose a successor, focusing on discovering the criteria for choosing a person who could succeed you. This is going to be a shock. So I'm warning you. Now, when you think of leadership, one of the things that we've been talking about as a principle is success in leadership has very little to do with projects. Very little to do with achievements of goals because every goal you achieve could be destroyed by someone who comes after you. So success in leadership is the preservation of success. How to preserve the things that you built, you laid your life down to achieve. How to make sure that they're not destroyed by succeeding generations. And we've seen this happen very often where when it's time for leaders to transition, many of them don't prepare the successor and so there is a conflict, a fight, a scuffle for leadership. And when a new leader emerges from that fight, sometimes their commitment is to destroy everything you built to prove that they are different or better. This has been the MO of most leaders. If you study the third world, for example, in all third world countries, this leadership 
issue is primary problem. Uh, most developing countries, when they have a leadership transition, there's either a coup or someone gets killed or there is tremendous turmoil in that country. The same thing happens in churches. Sometimes they say the worst thing for a church is a board. Because when it's time for leadership transition, there is so much fighting. Now, they don't use guns yet and bullets and machetes, but they're getting close lately. They will fight for the pastorate. They will fight to be the next bishop. They would kill. They would connive. They would all kind of strategizing to try and emerge as the leader. This is ungodly, unhealthy, and almost unbelievable. So this session is very critical. How do you choose a successor? Let me bring it down to one more context, and that is the family. When you talk about a family, you have a mother, a father with children, and you started a family business, and you're developing that family business, and let's say you got five or six kids. Listen to me carefully, please. First of all, don't assume that the person who should succeed you in whatever you do has to be one of your family members. You prefer it to be, but it doesn't have to be. And that's proven in the context of Scripture. But let's say perhaps you want to make sure that your business stays in the family, whether it's a company you just establish or some project that you built and you want your family, your kids to inherit it. It doesn't mean that those children will protect that product. As a matter of fact, there are millions of stories where families built big businesses and one of the siblings who didn't have the passion of their father or the passion of their mother for this business would literally sell that business for almost nothing. Sell it off and go buy a boat and go play golf or something. They destroy the family business because they have no interest in what their parents built. So even as a family, you can have a destruction of your dream. Question then is, how do you know which one of the children is the right one to take the business? We're going to talk about that in this session. You may have a board or assistants around you in your company, in your church, in your business, and you want to know which one of these should I really focus on to mentor, to become the one who takes all that I have possessed, all that I have developed. How do I know which one should I give it to? Very important question. Hopefully today, the answer that I'm going to share with you will help you. But I warn you, this will be a shock. Because I think in your mind, you already have an idea of who and what kind of person you already have spied or identified that probably is a potential successor. I believe that when I'm finished, they may not be the one. Because I'm going to dismantle all of your reasons probably for why you chose them. Because I too thought I knew who should be a, a perfect prospect for succession. And yet we need a successor. And so, here's some thoughts. I want to begin with the six principles for not choosing someone. I want to begin the negative first. Are you all sure you're ready for this? Okay. If you want to identify your successor, first of all, you never choose a person who loves your vision. Oh, dear. I guess I can now close the session and we can leave. Okay, there's a shock. See, we normally think that the person who captures our vision and loves our vision is the kind of person we should give the organization to. Well. I am proposing that that is not the right person. Don't let the fact that someone loves your vision be the criteria for choosing them as your successor. Number two, never choose the person who loves and wants your gift. You know, there are people around you 
who just love your gift loved your anointing they love your skill they they, they they love the way you do what you do and they just love it and they talk about it they tell you how great you are and that is not the kind of person you want to choose for your successor if somebody is all taken up with how great you are and how you can speak well how you can you know play well how you can sing well and they just love your gift how you can communicate well be cautious Number three, never choose the person who wants what you have. There are a lot of people around you in your life. And they want to be just like you, they say. Be careful. That is a dangerous person. Now, I know you're still in shock. But this is not the proper prospect for you. Never choose the person who wants what you have. They want your position, they want your title, they want your influence, they want your power. Be cautious. Number four, when choosing a successor, never choose the person who wants your power. There are people around you who literally worship your power. They are so impressed by your capacity to impress they love the way you impact and influence people they they just admire that they they and they want it and that's why they'll associate with you they'll tell you everything you need to hear and even want to hear just to be in the atmosphere of your power some people just love the just the experience of being around power and they want it dangerous person when you want to choose a successor never choose a person who wants positions of authority watch those people in your life who are constantly desiring to have the same authority you have they want you to, to promote them so they can have authority they would even try and convince you that they are good for you. They really want authority. Be cautious. How am I doing so far? I think I'm canceling your whole life right now. See, I told you. You thought you knew who's a good prospect for succession. And number six, never choose a person who believes they are wiser than you. There are people around you who say they are there to help you and to serve you, and they always quit criticizing you, always questioning you, always wondering why you're doing this and why you're doing it that way, and you think that, you know, that there's a better way to do it. And Be careful of those people who think they are wiser than you. Be cautious. They always know a better way to do it. <laughs> and they will question your methods and they, they, they believe that they have some new ideas that can help you. And they're always trying to make you think that, that, that you're not quite all of that. So watch those people. They volunteer wisdom. Be cautious. Now, each one of these I got from Jesus. He had 12 men around him. And he didn't trust too many of them. I know you don't believe that. And out of, out of, out of the 12, he actually identified three that he wanted to work with personally. And out of the three, he identified one that he trusted. He had, see, there are circles of people around you, and they're different circles. You can have a team with you, but they are not all in the same circle. He had 12. He, what about Bartholomew? You don't know much about Bartholomew. Or Thaddeus. I mean, you know, he kind of kept them on the fringes. He was even nervous about James and John, even though he 
pulled him into his inner circle. He was nervous about them because they had some defects. They, they, they are in this list. That's why he couldn't choose them. For example, James and John wanted power. Number four. They also thought they were wiser than Jesus. They told Christ, look, there's some people down the street who are not operating like we're operating. Let me give you some advice, Jesus. Call down fire and burn them up. These guys were crazy. They were terrorists. <laughs> Think about it. And right away, he changed their name. He says, you guys are sons of thunder. You guys are dangerous. You gotta, your, your temperament cannot handle power. They wanted power. They were the same two, remember, who sent their mother to ask him for positions of power. Christ says, I, I can't trust these guys. Who around you are always trying to get in your power circle? Study people. Now, who do you think lie on Jesus' chest all the time? It was John, and Christ says, I can't trust you with power. Not because folks are close to you means that they are qualified for succession. This, this must be also supply, applied to your children. You may have five kids. You better check and see this list against them. Because even though you may have one of your son or daughter, they may not be qualified. Remember Joseph, I mean Moses, his sister had a problem. Miriam, come on, you all remember Miriam? Miriam could not be the successor. Why? Wrong spirit. She wanted power. She even... Uh, had number six problem. She told Moses, you think God only speaks to you? Disqualified. People around you say, well, who do you think you are? Wrong person to choose. Am I coming through slowly? See, the, the, the folks who are close to you and they say they love you and, and all this stuff, but you got to have a criteria to identify who is a prospect for me to invest my time in to mentor. Give them tests. There were instances where Jesus Christ, the great leader of all times, would, would do certain things. He would, for example, have certain experiences, and he would literally say, look, uh, I only want you three to come. What's he doing? He's taking them into an environment where the other nine, he don't want them to come. He's, he wants to mentor this three at a different level. And he would allow them to see things the others didn't see. And then he would say to them, don't tell nobody what you saw. Why? I'm really testing you. There are people in my life who I would take into certain environments, others I won't. Because I am looking at criteria. I'm testing their spirit, their personality, their motivation, their attitude, because if you're going to give power to someone, you want to make sure that they don't want power. Very important. So when you talk about choosing a successor, you got to first decide what you don't want. Now, I know number one is a little sh shocking to most of you because we normally say, well, if someone loves your vision and they, got a, they, they captured your vision and they know your vision, then they are the natural successor. Not so. Sometimes people love your vision because they want to take it from you. They don't want to inherit it. They actually want to commit a coup. So someone tell you they love your vision doesn't mean they qualify for succession. Because the reason for loving your vision could be because they ain't got none themselves. And they'd like to just get the notoriety and the fame and the glory feeding of your vision by taking it over. What is the criteria? All right, so let me give you then the positive side. Who do you choose for a potential successor to your work, your business, your department, your company, your pastorate, even your political party? Who do you choose to succeed you? Okay, let's begin with number one.
how to identify your successor. First of all, choose one who loves you and not your vision. <laughs> Listen, this is heavy stuff. My sentences are very carefully written. First of all, you won't identify a person who doesn't love your vision, they love you. Number two, you would choose a person who loves you and not your gift. When you're looking for someone to invest in as a mentor, a mentee, to develop as a successor, you want to identify individuals who love you more than they, more than they love your gift. A lot of people come to you because of your gift, not because of you. I remember one time when I was reading this story, this record of this event, and I'm going to refer to Christ a lot in this session because I think he is the ultimate example of choosing a successor, and he was ultimately successful. One time he had fed a lot of people by a miracle. Do you remember those stories? 5,000 people were fed by fish and bread. And... And all of a sudden, he grew from, fifth, from 12 members to 70. You remember that story? Do you all read the Bible? Okay, yeah. He had 12 people, and then one day, it grew to 70. 300% growth in one day. How about that for your organization? Would you, wouldn't you get excited? Yeah. If you had 300 people in your church, and then one day you have 900, my, you would think that the Holy Ghost is with you. Well, look at his response to the growth. First of all, he turned around and realized he grew by 300%. He had 12, and in one day he has 70. Now, any leader, pastor, CEO, business person who company grows 300% in one day would have a celebration. He did the opposite. He turns to the 70 and he asks them a question. Do you remember the question? He said, why do you follow me? Now, wait a minute. Aren't you happy we are with you? He said, why do you follow me? Maybe you should ask that question to everybody in your circle. Go home, call a board meeting, and just ask that question, and spend an hour listening listen to the answers. Why do you follow me? We don't ask those questions. But a true leader has to ask those questions. Why are you supporting me? Why are you following me? I mean, you should be glad I'm following you. No, I want to know your motivation. Why did you join me? Hmm. Before they could answer, because they didn't know what to say, obviously, he answered the question for them. He said, I know why you follow me. Is it not because of the fish and bread I gave you yesterday? Have you ever asked why people are with you? It had nothing to do with him. He said, you love my gift. Don't trust everybody who applauds you. Don't be so quick to give delegate authority to people who seem to celebrate you because they may not be celebrating you. They're celebrating what you do for them, how they benefit from being with you. Some people's relationship with you is for their benefit, not for yours. Dangerous people. He said, 
I know why you follow me. It's because of the fish and bread, the gift, the miracle, the gift I have. And a lot of people follow me for that too. And they follow you for that. And then he said to them, um, if you want to be my disciple, he's talking now. He's like, if you really want to follow me, he says, then you don't eat fish and bread. You don't let that be the reason. But you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Oh, 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 he went deep. He said, don't love fish and bread, love me. The story goes that when he said that, the 70 went aside and had a private cell group meeting. And they discussed what he said. And they came back with a conclusion. They said, this is a hard saying. In other words, this is difficult what you are requiring. You want us to love you instead of your gifts. They said, we cannot give you that kind of commitment and they forsook him that's the end of the story they forsook him now watch this it says then he turned to the 12 who was left why because he ain't trusting nobody now he turns to the 12 he says do you want to go also you know I always tell people that true leaders are people who are willing to go alone Sometimes the only person you could trust is yourself and God. There are people who will tell you God sent them to help you and next week God changed his mind. So I am very distrustful. I'm telling you now, I don't trust people. You got to earn trust. He said, do you want to go also? And they were quiet for a while because I'm sure they thought about it. You know, this guy is crazy. He wants us to eat his flesh. He wants him to, his, his, himself to become the reason why we follow. And then one of them spoke up. His name was Peter. He's one of his favorite mentees. And Peter says, Lord, we really would like to leave you, but where are we going? Let me, let, 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 let me tell you something about this answer. You trust people who depend on you for their livelihood. Write that down quick. See, this is a different level of trust. When people depend on you to eat and to pay their bills, they become trustworthy. But if that person's around you have an alternative source of income. <laughs> they don't really need you to survive. You can't really give them certain levels of trust. You, when you're choosing a successor, it has to be someone who sees you as their source. Peter says, you have the words of life. You gave me life. I live of you. Notice, I left my fishing boat, my industry, my company. I am living of you. Where are we going to go? Has anyone around you abandoned themselves to, to you? Who do you trust? You should never give your organization over to someone who has an alternative source of income. Oh boy. Because after all, they don't need it. <laughs> Peter says, I have nowhere else to go. And I believe Christ took his pen out, made a note, put Peter's name down. This guy, I like this guy.
Choose the person who loves you and not your gift. Number three, how do you choose a successor? Choose the one who loves you more than your power. Humans naturally gravitate, gravitate to power. They, we, we love powerful people. That's why we want to get to know powerful people. Because we, we like to be in the, in the environment of power. Matter of fact, power is like drugs. It's intoxicating. Some of you wonder why people have groupies. Groupies are people who just love power. They like to be around power. Politicians attract groupies. Stars attract groupies. Powerful, wealthy people attract groupies. We don't have to be around the power. It, 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 it gets into your nostrils. You, you become intoxicated. You like to be able to say, I know him. I know her. There's this sense of, hmm, I'm close to power. Be careful. Bad prospects for succession. You want people around you who want to serve your vision and serve you. They come around you to serve. You know, every one of, of the successful succession stories in the Bible was between a mentor and a servant. And they got the whole company. I think about Joshua and Moses. Do you know that Joshua was never called the servant of the Lord? Never. When you read the whole story, he was always called the servant of Moses. I mean, this guy, he never saw himself as serving the Lord. He even never used the title. That's why he got the job. Why is it quiet? There are people who want to associate with you because of your power, your influence. And you got to check them. Number four, you want to choose the person for your successor who is willing to protect and defend you at their own expense. I want you to think this through. You want to choose as a successor the person who is willing to protect you and defend you at their own expense. Are those people around you? If they join in with criticism against you when they are not with you, you are in danger. If people attack you and they don't speak up to protect you, don't give them power. Are those people in your circle? I'm giving you a lot of ammunition today. I want you to go home and look at your whole leadership team. Don't say anything. Just look at them and study them against this list. And you'll be amazed that you may disqualify all of them. And sometimes it's the quiet person who's been with you for a little while, longer than they, but never got any position, they're not pushy, they're probably the best ones. God's saying, look, that person just loves you. How do you choose a successor? Well, number five, choose one who is willing to die for you. Not too many people will qualify here, but this is important. And when I say die, you know, it could be literally, 
but I'm also talking about dying to their own ambitions, to their own interests, to their own preferences. They're willing to die for you. They're willing to give up what they have a right to for your sake. I think we talked about Joshua yesterday how when the 70 prophets were were anointed by Moses and they began to act just like Moses because they had the same spirit upon them and they began to prophesy just like Moses it says that Joshua became angry why because Joshua loved Moses and he ran to the tent and said Moses Moses master master he says there are people out there they want to take your job I got to protect your job he says, tell them to stop prophesying. And Moses says, Joshua, oh Joshua, are you jealous for me? Not of me? By the way, there are people who are jealous of you who are with you. And they're very close to you. They're waiting for you to drop dead. I remember the story of Peter when they began to work miracles. There was a guy who wanted to actually financially invest in his ministry so he could get the power. <laughs> there are some folks who want to be on your board financially just to get close to the vision because they like what you're doing and they won't take it over they'll finance their way into your board and Peter says may your money perish with you because your motivation for coming with me is questionable Choose the person who is willing to die. Now I'm going to explain this before we close to show you how these work. But each one of these is a criteria for your successor. By the way, you know, Barnabas and Silas and Timothy went to jail with Paul. Can you find someone to go to jail with you? Why do you think Paul gave the ministry over to Timothy? He went to jail with him. Willing to die with him. Are there people around you when the whole city attacks you they are still with you? You know, in my own country here when I was beginning this work I used to be a daily offering on the altar of criticism. And there are people here in this room today who used to be part of that. And there are people here today who were with me all through that. I trust them with my life. What did I do? In Jesus' name. So you got to be careful of those in your circle. And you must ask that question. Will they die for me? Will they defend me and become the minority? And number seven, number six rather, choose the person who would take a risk for your benefit. Study the people in your circle and see who qualifies for this. They are willing to take a risk for your benefit. Tough criteria. Okay. Basically, what I'm saying is this. Don't choose people who like what you have, what you possess. Choose the person who loves you. 
when Jesus Christ, the greatest leader of the biggest company in history, was ready to transition and give up the position to someone else, he chose a person who seemed to have been the unlikely person. He was not the educated one. He was not the smart one. He was not the most intelligent one. And yet he gave him the whole company. Why? Because when you read the process of his identifying his successor, it defies all of your criteria. He's in the room with the 12, with the 11 rather, because Judas had taken his life. He's in, he's, he's in this room, and he, he's, he knows I have to move on, and I have to turn this company over to someone. Now, notice, uh, he, was, he was alive and healthy when he did this. Did you hear what I just said? He was alive and what? Healthy, even resurrected when he turned it over, which means you don't turn it over because you're sick or half dead or someone killing you. You're supposed to be willing to leave it in good health with a lot more life to live. The average leader today is committed to dying in the position and they will kill anyone who tries to stop them from dying in that position. That's not leadership, that's insecurity. A true leader is not attached to the chair. They don't need a position or a title to be valuable. He was healthy, he was whole, and he was leaving. What a way to go. Wouldn't it be great to call a board meeting and say, okay, friends, I got a lot more life to live, so I'm going to leave you all. And I need to identify my successor. You know, I admire someone like John Maxwell. John Maxwell and I work together very often. Uh, he reads my books, I read his. And we meet different places, we talk. And what I love about John Maxwell is John Maxwell used to be a pastor of a very healthy church. And when the Lord spoke to him and says, look, I want you to go out and teach leadership, he turned his entire ministry that he built over to the person next to him. He's a, a successor that he mentored. That's why he has such a powerful mentoring program. Because he did it. They didn't throw him off the board or voted him out. Some folks, you know, they don't get a new call until someone voted them out. Let me say it slow. Some people don't get a new call of God until the old board voted them out. Don't let that happen to you. You're a true leader. You must be willing to transition. And so he's, he's in the room, healthy, resurrected, and he has these 12 guys, and he has to make a decision. He's about to decide who's going to be in charge of a company that would eventually have 2 billion clients. A global company with a global product. Go into all the world and take my product, he says. He's about to turn over billions and billions and billions of people and souls and resources to one other person. Wow. He's about to turn over a divine earthly assignment to a flesh human. That's a big decision. And there are 12 guys in the room. Two of them already wanted position. James and John. The others were actually angry that, that they didn't get to ask for it first. You all remember that? They were indignant, the Bible says, when they found out that the other two wanted. So, so all of them had the same spirit. Who does he choose to give it to? Well, he tells us the only criteria. Let's read it. When they had finished eating, having their final meal together, he turned around in the meeting and he turned to Peter. And he said, Simon, son of Jonas, one criteria, do you love 
me. Not my ministry, not my vision, not my talents, not my gifts, not my anointing, not my miracles, not my influence, not my impact, not my books and my ministry and my television program. Do you love me? That's it. Can you find someone in your group who love you? That cancels a lot of people. Because when you start asking why they're with you, you get a million answers. Like fish and bread. His criteria was simple. Do you love me? Not my vision? Oh, I understand your vision, brother. That's an awesome vision. God told me to come and help you with that vision. That's a powerful vision. That's an awesome vision. We can reach the world together. That's a vision. I don't trust you. You love my vision too much. You never mentioned me. Choosing a successor is not simple. Look at the next statement. He repeats it again. So Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Now, how does the Lord know he loves him? And how does Peter know he knows? This is very important. Because you should be able to say that if someone asks you that. Do you love me? You should be able to answer that question. With confidence. Peter says, you know I love you. Now remember, he had just denied him. At least you call it denial. I don't. So he, he asks him again. He said, okay, then if you love me, everybody say me. If you love who? Me, then do what? Take over, he says. You feed my sheep, feed my lambs. You, you, you have the company. The company is yours. He asked him three times, do you love me? That's criteria for succession. Do you love me? Three times, do you love me? He's okay. You love me? Good. Then you have the company. It says, again, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you truly love me? Nothing to do with the anointing, the power, the miracles, the vision, the kingdom. Do you love me? What an amazing qualification. He's about to transfer the greatest organization in history. And the only criteria he wants is not are you educated? Are you intelligent? Can you plan administrative skills, executive powers, history, experience, expertise? No. Do you love me? That's it. Who do you choose? Who do you mentor to take all your powers, all your accomplishments? Who, who do you give it to? You know, it's even tough to identify who loves you. Think about it. Because you don't know why they're around you. And you have to take them through some tests. You know, I happen to serve as the chairman and founder of this organization. And, you know, we have a large group of trustees. And I test their love by their willingness to come here without any promise of getting any compensation. Pay your own ticket, pay your own hotel bill. If you love me, then you love what I love. If you only come because you're speaking or because we pay paying something, then I, I question your love for me. It, it's a simple. The way you weed people out is let their association with you cost them something.
Jesus told the disciples, you want to follow me? Then you got to deny your mother, your father, your children, your farms. He was stripping them of ulterior motives. Let it cost something for association. Because people are with you because what they can get from you, see? Not because they love you. Peter, do you love me? He said, okay, then feed my sheep. You know, Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He answers it twice. You know I love you. What do you mean you know? How do, how do I know? He says, you, you, you know you tested me. I'm so glad you're here today. The folks who work in your department at, at that business, PTC or, or the bank or managers, the management team, listen, you are in charge. You, you are awesome. You, you're wonderful. But it's amazing. They, who do you give the department to when you leave? There are people praying for your death. They are conniving for your removal. There are people in the boardroom who have already created a little system to get rid of you. Can you find someone who loves you? And by the way, some of the greatest political coups take place in churches. No love. They got the spirit of James and John. They sneak around the back and send their mother to get a position. And these are spiritual leaders fighting over succession. Okay, let me wrap this up with some conclusions and then I'll tell you a story about one of these issues with Peter and then we're going to go to our next session. Everybody say the power of love, succession. That's your criteria for succession. Who do you choose as your successor? Number one, whoever loves you will love who you love. Please write this down, please. It's very important. Who do you choose? You choose the person who loves you. Why? Because if they love you, they will love who? Who you love. Let me put it another way. If I love you, and you my friend, I love you, I really love you, and you married, if you die, I'll take care of your wife. I have had to counsel church leaders who, whose spouses started an, a ministry, built the ministry, all the kids were in the ministry, powerful ministry, worth millions of dollars, and when this person dies, the board kicked the spouse out, voted the kids off the staff. They were waiting for him to die. They withdrew the insurance on his wife. This has been repeated over and over again. And I'm like, how could you all do this? This man built this ministry from nothing. Yeah, 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 but you know, uh, it's our time now. And these are his close deacons and board members and elders. Got rid of his wife in one week. Why? They did not love him. This is a very important one. Whoever loves you will love who you love. Do you know that Peter fell in love with the wife of Jesus? Because he loved Jesus. Some of y'all are slow. When they took Peter before the council and said, we're going to kill you because you are promoting this man you love, Peter says, Take my head off. I'll still preach his name. Leave it on, I'll preach it. You make a decision, sir. He loved him so much. He was willing to die for his wife. 
can you trust your spouse to someone after you die? I said, take care of her. That's who you want to succeed you. That brings security to your children. You don't know what's going to happen when you die to your own family if the people around you don't love you. They want your organization. They want your vision. They want the money. They want the buildings. That's what they want. They're glad to get rid of you. And anything that reminds them of you, they got to get rid of. So his criteria is correct. Do you love me? Secondly, whoever loves you will love what you love. If the person loves you, then they'll love what you built. They won't destroy it. They'll protect what you worked your life for. They will not allow people to abuse it and, and uh, uh, confiscate it and, and sell it off. You know, Mr. Ford, who built a Ford company, uh, his great 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 grandson is now in charge of Ford Motor Company. And sometimes I see why you got to keep it in the family because you can't trust other people. Sometimes we got a people uh, a company here. Uh, the first, it's the first black uh, company that I would say was a successful company of succession. It's, it's a store here called Milo Butler and Sons. As the first successful black business, because what he did was he made sure that he found the kids who loved what he was doing. So that when he died, they didn't sell the store. Will the people around you confiscate what you built after you die? Do they love what you love? If they love you, they love your vision. And they protect it. Number three, whoever loves you will protect what you love. They will always want to make sure nothing happens to it. Number four, whoever loves you will value what you love. They'll value your children. They'll value your spouse. They'll value the things you built. They'll value your vision. They'll value your personality. They will keep alive the things that make you valuable. Some people are glad to bury you along with your memory. Take his picture down. Wow. This man spent 50 years with his blood and now you take his picture down. Do they love you? I'm not concerned about your success. I don't trust your success because your success could destroy it. Are you working on your mentoring? In my next session today, I'm going to talk about how to mentor because your mentoring will determine what happens after you die. And this last one, whoever loves you will preserve what you love. The church of Jesus Christ was a beautiful woman that's his wife. Her name is Ecclesia. And Peter loved his master so much, he preserved his wife. He went to prison on behalf of his wife. He defended his wife in court. Will they defend your wife or will they get rid of her? I wonder if I could trust Ruth Ann with the people around me. If I die today, what would happen to my wife? Do you love me? If you love me, you'll love what I love. Is there a reason why it's quiet in here? You see, the people who you give your hard working life to could destroy it in a day if they don't love you. Here's a story I want to close with. Why did Jesus trust Peter? Why did he know Peter loved him? He set Peter up. Okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He knows everything. He set Peter up many times. Matter of fact, one time, 
he began to talk to him about his death. Remember that? And he told him, he says, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified. And they're going to pluck my beard out. They're going to whip me. And they're going to, you know, bury me. And, and Peter became angry in the meeting. Remember that meeting? And Peter said, Master, stop it. That shall not happen to you. Stop it. They will not kill you. He said, I'll die if they try to do that. In other words, he was the only one that spoke up. What were the other 11 thinking? <laughs> he won't, if he won't die, that's his business. I ain't going with him. You know, he has his business. But Peter says, over my dead body. And Peter, and Jesus Christ took out his pad again, took his pen, and put number two. And then he set him up again. He said, let's go pray. They went to the garden. He says, now you nine stay here. At least you eight stay here because Judas was gone. He says, you three come with me, stay here, and then I'll go over here and pray. Now, you all stay awake. Watch for me. Watch for me. Which means he knew something would happen. He set Peter up. He, he has the final test now for these three guys. He said, let me see which one of them can take the company. Let's see who loves me. The soldiers came to arrest him. Judas kisses him, so you know he, he's, he's out of the runnings. And, and uh, when the soldiers arrive, it says they all fled, except Peter. Peter grabs his knife, little short sword, and there is a guard. Now, guard means at least six to 60 people. Did you hear what I just said? A, a, a guard is either six people or 60 people. In other words, that group would have been between 6 and 60. Soldiers with weapons, shields and swords and daggers. These guys are military experts. And Peter, who is a fisherman, grabs his knife and says, touch my master. Come on. Just try to touch my master. Don't you touch my boss. Is there someone who will pull a knife out and put you behind them? Peter died that day. Because you don't pull out a knife to fight soldiers in those days. You are dead. Now, Christ watches this. He's just standing by. I, I believe he was smiling. He's smiling. I love it. And Peter not only takes his knife out, but he swings it. Which means he is dead. If there's six soldiers and you only got one heir, you're dead. He swings at the guy's neck. The guy ducks. His, near, his ear falls off. And Jesus is watching the whole thing. He's in... And he's going, I think I got my man. Is there someone who would swing for you? The air falls to the ground. There's blood running all over the guy's uniform. The other soldiers are ready to kill Peter. And Peter's standing there with blood on his knife, breathing out, saying, Don't touch my boss. Don't touch my boss. He's dead. And Christ does something real interesting. He leans down, picks up the air. In other words, he's saying, okay, I'm clear. And he puts the air back on, fixes it back. Can you hear? Yes, Lord. Okay, good. Give us the air back. And then he turns who? To Peter. Not the sword. He's talking to the Peter. He said, Peter, okay, that's enough. Put your sword up. In other words, I'm convinced.
the story doesn't end there. Here's how it ends. It says the soldiers led Jesus away, tied him up, led him away. And Peter is the only one who shouldn't want to follow him because the soldiers already know his face. And Peter says, I'm not leaving my boss. Now the other 11, uh, 11 I mean 10, nowhere to be found. And Peter, and this is, this is the beautiful part of the story, Peter follows him. And you know, it's, a, it's amazing. Look at Jesus. He says, verse 11, Peter, put up your sword. Shall I not drink the cup the Father gave me? In other words, Peter, I am satisfied. I set this up. You passed the test. Let me go ahead and die. I came to die anyhow, but I wanted to make sure you were willing to die for me. Succession should be given to those who are willing to die for you because they love you. Verse 15, Simon Peter and another disciple. We don't know who this person was. It wasn't one of the ten. It says, Peter and another disciple were following who? Jesus. This guy just tried to kill a soldier. You don't follow a guy who you just tried to kill. My point is, he refused to even let Jesus go on trial by himself. I want to get into the courtroom. And he fought to get into the courtroom. He even lied to stay there. Do you hear me? No, you don't hear me. We call it denial. I call it love. He loved him so much, he lied to stay. They said, we know you. He said, you don't know me. I want to stay. I want to watch what you do to my boss. I want to watch everything. I'm going to support him. Will they support you when you're by yourself under stress? Who loves you? They'll abandon you the minute the media attacks you. He says, no, I'm going all the way with my boss. And he went into the inner courts, sat around a fire watching the trial just to make sure his boss is okay. And they said, what are you doing here? He said, look, just leave me alone. I don't know him. I got to stay close to him. I call it denial love. And that was it. Christ was convinced. This guy loves me. It says in verse 16, Peter had to wait outside the door. Are you reading this? This guy just tried to kill a soldier. What are you doing where the soldiers are? And refusing to leave because his love for his chief. Can you find someone like that in your company? I wanted your kids that way in the house. Not because they are your children doesn't mean they qualify for succession. Which one of the kids love you? See, you see, families are strange. You love because you're obligated, not because you choose to. There might be one of the kids who chose to love you. That's a different kid. They're the ones who are willing to give their career to keep what you're doing going. So you know, Daddy, I'm a doctor, but I, I don't want what you started to, to, to die, so I'm going to stop being a doctor, and I'm going to pick up the company and take care of the company. That's a kid who loves you. There's a son who says, well, that's my daddy's business. That's what he wants to do. If he dies, when he dies, that's his problem. You know, I'm a, I'm a dentist. I can take care of my dental career. And this kid doesn't love the father. This is why the Bible says uh, friends are closer than family. Because family is obligation love. Friend is a choice. This is why adopted kids are loved more than kids who were born naturally. Because adoption is a decision. In other words, you need your kids to adopt you as a parent, not just love you as a father. Peter adopted Jesus. You will not die. I'm going to stay with you. And he gave him the whole company. My prayer is that you would find people somewhere in your circle when you go back home 
and you take this list and you go down this list and you study them and you begin to check is the person I was planning to turn this over to qualified and there's only one qualification and it's not education it's love thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.